It's so exciting to be in Kansas. This is my first ever time in Kansas. And what an occasion to be celebrating freedom, in particular, the freedom of parents to choose not just their children's schools, but to choose their children's education. Um, my remarks are going to focus on what I consider the most innovative advance in parental choice and education, and that's education savings accounts, or ESAs. Um, as we all know, parental choice is perhaps one of the most widely studied aspects in education. Not that we'd exactly know it from media reports that call the results inconclusive or mixed. Um, now, I'm not going to go through the past 60 years of empirical evidence that shows, gosh, letting parents pick their children's schools, their education providers, actually works. But what I am going to say is that um, if all the doomsday scenarios about parental choice were true, my home state of Arizona would be a cautionary tale. I'm a research fellow at the Independent Institute in Oakland, California, but my husband, um, myself, and my four stepsons, all of whom are school age, live in Arizona. So Arizona actually isn't a cautionary tale. It's, ex it's actually an exemplar. Here are some examples. By the way, Arizona, if you're an Arizona parent, you have more options over where your children goes to school than any other state in the country. Uh, name a school choice program, we have it all, and chances are we were the first out of the gate with it. Uh, we stopped assigning children to, to uh, public schools back in 1994. We had the highest per capita concentration of public charter schools. We were the first state back in 1997 to have uh, tax credit scholarship programs. We we are the first state out of the gate to have education savings accounts. So we're like that old commercial. Those of us of a certain age will remember the commercials with, oh, give that new cereal to Mikey. Mikey will eat anything. Arizona, we'll, we'll try just about anything. So what about all these ir arguments that we and other states hear about, oh, gosh, you can't let parents you know, pick their kids' schools if we don't sign them to the district schools. We're, you know, that's going to, we're going to destroy public education. Really? Well, we're on our third generation of parental choice. Here are the results to date. Right now, Arizona has more top 25 public high schools than any other state in the country. Five in all. That's more than New York and California combined. And Arizona spends the least per student of all of those top 25ers. We spend around $9,000 on average per student. Oh, by the way, we spend about $3,200 less per student than Kansas. My understanding is you're having a little difficulties with your courts and uh, school funding these days. <laughs> well, by the way, for Kansas, again, you spend a heck, uh, almost a third more than we spend. And uh, sorry, none of your schools rank in the top 100 of best public high schools. Well, what about number two? Arizona's African-American eighth graders now have, have the highest math scores in the country on the nation's report card. Yes, that's right, our African-American students beat Massachusetts's African-American students. And number three, since 2009, Arizona public high school students have posted the highest math gains between fourth and eighth grade on the nation's report card. And since 2011, our public charter school students have posted the highest reading gains. Our district public students are number three, by the way. So, not too shabby for a state that's been portrayed as one of the country's most notorious school funding cellar dwellers, ranking 49th nationally for more than a decade. By the way, we're among 13 states that in any given year, oh, we're all ranked 49th, so we're in good company. So the achievements in Arizona show what's possible for Kansas with expansive parental choice programs like Arizona has, again, Universal district choice. Districts do not have the authority, absent you know, health and fire codes, to turn a public school student down. We have unlimited public charter school choice, none of this cap nonsense. We have expansive <clears throat> private school choice in Arizona with our tax credit pro scholarship programs. We have four. We also have education savings accounts, which it's never nirvana in these battles. We should have expanded it. We should have made it universal last year. Some of our lawmakers wimped out. Look out for next year. We're going to be expanding it universally. And hopefully, Kansas, with results like this, can take the next step 
and build on your terrific tax credit scholarship program and have a universal ESA program for your students as well. And what's so wonderful about parental choice is we are now in our third generation of parental choice. What does that mean? Students who benefited from parental choice programs years ago are now using these programs for their own children. So the idea that you would assign a parent to any type of school in Arizona, it, it's like you're from another planet. It would never fly in our state. But ESAs, like I said, are the latest advance in educational choice. And by putting parents in charge of their children's educations, ESAs empower them to choose not just where their children are educated, but how their children are educated. That's something that the educational choice debate needs to move on. It's not just school choice, it's parental choice. For that very reason, it's no longer about schools. The way we educate children today, I would say within 15, 20 years, it's going to be unrecognizable. The advances are happening so quickly. Today, ESA programs are flourishing in four additional states. Florida, Tennessee, Mississippi, and Nevada, which is the model to follow. All public school students are eligible for their ESAs. And their program was deemed constitutional on two grounds. Their legislature has to go back to the drawing board and just clean up an appropriation me mechanism. But universal ESAs are the next step for really empowering parents. So what are ESAs? Well, there are several advantages. The first thing about ESAs are that they are easy to use. The concept behind ESAs is simple. Parents who don't prefer a public school education for their children simply inform the state, and the state deposits at least 90% of what it would have sent to that child's school district into that child's ESA instead. Parents get a type of dedicated use debit card to purchase uh, authorized educational expenses, private school tuition, testing fees, tutoring, online courses, private school therapies, and in most programs like Arizona's, those funds, unused funds, roll over from one year to the next for future expenses, including college. And people like to say, oh my goodness, isn't that busting the bank? First year of our program, the, it was limited to special needs students. We all know that special needs students, on average, cost about double what uh, your regular student population costs. By the end of the year, the average amount of money left over in each child's ESA was around $5,000. I want you to keep that in mind. The next time you hear the excuses, it's too hard, it's too expensive to educate children with special needs unless we completely bust the budget. Empower parents, and what they report is, this is unprecedented, you never hear this. Arizona parents give it 100% of Arizona participating parents approve of the program. They are highly, they are highly uh, satisfied with the program. You never hear that. So what about, what about the second benefit of ESAs? They offer unlimited choices. It's not that you can go to this type of school and that, this type of place. More than one third of Arizona parents using ESAs are purchasing a variety of different services. So some may go to private schools and pay for private school tuition. Others are, but we're getting tutors, we're getting after school therapies, we're, we're taking AP courses, we're customizing all of it. And that's where education needs to go. That's the thing about freedom. It's not neat and tidy, it's going to be. We don't want one best system. There is no such thing as one best system. So parents are um, really customizing their children's education based on those children's individual needs. Now the third thing about ESAs is, gosh, are they popular. Fully, again, 100% of Arizona parents are satisfied with the program, but there's a rapid expansion of ESA programs across the country. It's five states right now, even in Arizona alone, every year participation has been doubling. Florida's program has basically tripled. Even though Nevada's program um, was under an injunction. So parents didn't know, gosh, is this program going to be available, which would typically suppress participation. They had, oh, they had around 8,000 kids on the waiting list ready for ESAs. That's because there's no other parental choice program. It's basically one big district that dominates. So they're, they're monopoly busting in Nevada, which is great. But let's look at the polling. A national poll released last year, by the way, this was by people t seem to think Republicans, you know, are on the right. People love parental choice. People on the left don't. It's not true. A, a poll 
released by a Democratic-leaning uh, firm found that seven out of 10 likely voters support greater parental, parental, education, parental choice in education and believe that competition improves schools. That's an important finding because you talk to school, talk to school people and my goodness, competition is bad because there are winners and losers. We all know from our own lives that competition may not make our lives easier, but it sure does make us better. And if you look at across the board from the political spectrum, about 60% of those who identify as Republicans favor ESAs. About 60% of Democrats favor ESAs. That jumps to almost, you know, almost two thirds among independents, particularly among people 18 to 35. So what about, you know, that sounds really good, but we know what happens when we start handing out money. It's not going to be, we've got to be careful what parents are going to do with it. ESAs are not only popular, they are fiscally responsible. Funds are dispersed quarterly, and future funds are only dispersed after participating parents have submitted uh, educational receipts for independent verification. I would love to stand up here and tell you that since 2011, there has been no bad actors in Arizona's program. No, there have been about a handful of parents who did not use the money as they were supposed to. But here's the difference. We found out about it within a few months. The amount of money we're talking about is in the thousands. And by the way, under our program, there's a zero tolerance policy for misspending or fraudulent spending. So if you are caught and you will be caught, you not only have to pay back that money, your child is never eligible again. So there's strong incentive for good governments. Now think about some of the newspaper stories we read. There's barely a year that goes by, <clears throat> or a semester for that matter when years later we found out that a former superintendent has, has absconded with tens of millions of dollars that should have gone to the education of children. Are we ever getting that money back? No, that money's gone. So that's one of the things I like about ESAs, they're fiscally responsible. Finally, ESAs pass constitutional muster. Recent unsuccessful legal challenges to ESA programs in Arizona and Florida show that ESAs are constitutional for a variety of reasons. And I focus on these constitutional issues because I have to tell you, I don't care if you're talking about a publicly funded voucher, a privately funded tax credit scholarship program, charter schools, any sort of parental choice, opponents of parental choice are gonna use these same exact arguments. They are not true. First, ESAs are neutral with regard to religion because they make a variety of educational options available to parents, and they, not government, do the choosing. Second, ESAs do not run afoul of constitutional religious bans or Blaine amendments because funds are for the benefit of students, not schools, and no ESA funds are ever directed to gov by government to any particular education provider. And finally, the courts have rejected out of hand the notion that parental choice through ESAs harms public schools, students, or teachers. As opponents frequently put it, because they drain money. The courts have just absolutely thrown that out. In conclusion, using public dollars for individual education choices is not some earth-shattering idea. Right now, there are nine million college students nationwide using more than $32 billion in federal Pell Grant funds to attend the colleges and universities of their choice, public and private, religious and non-sectarian alike. In just a few years, most of those students are going to become parents and um, they're gonna want to send their children to the schools of their choice. But guess what? They're not gonna be allowed to in far too many states. So those children can't exercise parental choice for their children until they become 18 and they can pick their colleges. ESAs expand the kind of personalized learning that has long been available for higher education students, but not for school-age children. Every student, regardless of his or her circumstances, should have the opportunity for personalized learning. Education savings accounts are easy to use, they offer unlimited choices, they're popular, they're fiscally responsible, and they pass constitutional muster. There is no good reason Kansas school children should be denied the kind of learning opportunities ESAs make possible, because all Kansas school children deserve a personalized education customized by the ones who know and love them best, their parents. Thank you very much.